It's uh, great to be with you this morning. Hope that you're doing well as we collectively attempt to navigate the increasing complexity of life in America. How do you speak at a time like this? However, it's an opportunity to share with you what God has been teaching me in these coronavirus days. This morning is uh, somewhat ironic because as I confessed to you last week, I am a lousy listener, and I have many illustrations of my lack of ability to be a good listener, and, uh, but I will not bore you with those. Uh, however, I started with a question in relationship to the discipline of listening. That was, what keeps me certified as a lousy listener? It's quite easy to answer that question. The thing that keeps me from learning is, of course, me. It's the problem of me, but that's another sermon. In these challenging days, I think that I think I need to rethink some things. One of the things that I need to rethink is that I need to listen to others in order to reevaluate some opinions that I have. So I want to dive deep with you in listening and learning this morning. Point number one. I need to grow in the area of listening to God. There are five main sources that I've discovered where I can learn to listen, to hear God's voice more clearly. The first is through his word, the Bible. Primarily, it's the way for all of us to hear God's voice speak to us. The second is through nature and God's creation. I've enjoyed worshiping outside on Sunday mornings. Hope you guys get a chance to visit with us. We are one of the most sanitary churches in the entire county. We have a good plan to keep you from getting the grunge from us for sure. A uh, third way that we hear God's voice and can learn to listen to him are through other believers and circumstances, through wise counsel. And I've Given, been given my counsel throughout my life, and I'm grateful for that. The fourth way that I've discovered is through music. In worshiping God, I often hear his voice uh, as I sing to him. The fifth way is through prayer and meditation and communication through the Holy Spirit. And uh, as we listen, prayer is not just talking to God, it's also listening to God, and so that's what we call meditation I've also discovered that I am attempting to listen to God, that there will be three voices that I hear in my head. The first voice is the voice of my own mind. This is a voice that we will hear most often. It includes your conscience and conscious thoughts. Counselors all will often refer to this as self-speak. It can be accumulation of thoughts from your life. An illustration of this would be hearing your mom's voice saying what all moms say to their kids, you're not going anywhere until you clean your room. Right on. The second voice that you will hear, fortunately, is the voice, unfortunately, is the voice of the enemy. And he usually shouts temptations our way. Satan usually speaks ungodly thoughts, stinky attitudes, or devious temptations. You've all heard his voice. It's what he does. Well, tell him to scram like Jesus did, and use scripture if you can. Remember that that is what we refer to often as the battleground of our mind. The third voice that you can hear is the comforting voice of the Holy Spirit of God. And while Satan shouts his temptations at us, God usually whispers to us. Therefore, we have to quiet ourselves in order to hear his whispers, his still small voice, this is how God's voice is described as he spoke quietly to the prophet Elijah on Mount Horeb. To learn to listen for those three voices that speak into our mind is something that we can do to increase our discipline of listening in our lives. Uh, if you hear more voices than that, you might want to talk to your doctor. 
All right, so point number one is learning the discipline of listening in order to hear God's voice. Point number two is to learn the discipline of listening because you love people. Funny thing, listening requires that I listen. But if I do, my listening can lead to learning. If I learn to listen, I will show people that I care about them. Pastor Michael challenged us before he left that we should fully embrace his greatest, the greatest of the commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. At this point in life, I think I'm honestly able to say that I'm doing good with the first part of the great commandment. In fact, it's easy for me to love God. He has really given to me everything that I am. I feel that I am one of the most blessed people in the entire world, and it's all because of him. Therefore, loving God is a natural response to the experience of 60 years of walking with him in his daily favor. And by, that, by, by the way, that 60 years uh, is about 22,000 days. And however, the second part of the great commandment, the loving thy neighbor as myself, well, that's another thing. Specifically, if your neighbor might be problematic, maybe somebody who has a dog that barks intermittently between the hours of 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. every night, all year long. So point number three is that I need to learn the discipline of listening well because I live in a community. We were created to be in community with God and community with one another. One of the prominent things that I have heard from you guys is that we really miss worshiping together. God created us to live and act and worship in a community. Anything that disturbs our community disturbs us. When we can't worship together like we desire, we get disturbed. Some of us are even angry that this virus has come upon us, and that's an acceptable emotion. Many, many people have lost their lives because of this serious illness. It is more than reasonable to be angry. But what is behind the emotion of anger? Counselors tell me that anger is not the primary emotion that we're experiencing most of the time. The primary emotion behind anger is our fear. For our example, in our own context, we are afraid that our worshiping together has been taken from us and that, breed, that fear breeds anger. Therefore, I want to learn to listen to God and listen to others. And I will want to learn to listen to others because I live in a community. Listening in a community means that if I care about my community, and I do, I must learn to listen to my neighbors because Jesus challenged us to love our neighbors as much as we love him. Wow, that's hard for me to understand. So I want to tell you something before I tell you something, if you can work with me and stick with me in that. In living in community, I observe that we all have different opinions about things. We're Americans, right? All Americans have opinions. Just ask us and we'll tell you. As Americans, we need to realize that we all have opinions. Or I'm going to use a different word that we usually use in a negative sense. A synonym word for the word opinion in English is a word prejudice. When using the word prejudice in this way, I mean for you to understand that some prejudices can be negative, which is the usual way we use the word, and some prejudices can be helpful because they help us keep things simple in our lives and our brains. In a negative sense, prejudices can influence the way that we behave towards certain people, and that can be bad. So I want to use the word prejudice in a different way that our minds might currently be thinking. For example, it is good to be prejudiced towards certain dangers, like driving your car. Yes, driving your car is a very dangerous thing to do. So if you don't trust other drivers, or more accurately, the decisions that they will make while driving, that is very wise. 
That's a good opinion or prejudice. We might also refer to not trusting other people while driving as a good or positive prejudice, opinion, or stereotype. So you're seeing where I'm heading with this. A positive prejudice or stereotype or opinion is something that helps us deal with the challenges of daily life. So what should we make of these positive stereotypes or prejudices? We should recognize them consciously, like not trusting other motorists, or subconsciously, like not trusting certain types of motorists, like, for example, a teenager. For a more specific example, if you are driving around town and you see one of those student driver signs on top of a vehicle, what do you do? I personally give them a lot of space. I also give pizza delivery cars a lot of space. They are usually in a hurry and might be less safe than other drivers uh, because time is money for them. Now, I don't feel the same way about taxi cab drivers because my prejudice is affected by the fact that I know that the taxi cab driver gets paid by the minute. So, the driver of the taxi is depending upon their rider to pay them for delivering them safely to their destination. In achieving that goal, the taxi driver is in no hurry to get where they're going. In fact, they take longer and the more safely that they drive, the more they will get paid. They're professional drivers, not student drivers. My prejudices are well-founded and affirmed by auto insurance companies. However, student drivers might actually be more cautious because they're being given direct instruction as to how to drive safely. The downside is that according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, per mile driven, teenage drivers from 16 to 19 years of age are nearly three times more likely than drivers age 20 and older to be involved in a fatal automobile crash. Therefore, my assumption or prejudice to give student drivers a wide berth on the roadway seem to be backed up by some data. Out of this common illustration of my opinion or prejudice towards young drivers is that I need to recognize that I have developed an opinion towards them. It also illustrates that I have prejudices. Some of them might be bad. Some of them might be good. Some of my prejudices might be well-founded. Others might not. If I have a prejudices, then it is good to recognize that I am being affected by those prejudices because they have been away from me to help me think or to help me drive my car. My prejudices have helped me become a safer thinker and therefore I have become a safer driver. This has been verified by my insurance company. Because of my age, all insurance companies think that I have a good prejudice toward not trusting other drivers and therefore they have lowered the rates that they've charged me as I've gotten older. Ha! Huh. By the way, did you know that you can save up to 15% on your auto insurance? Just kidding. Seeing if you're awake. Also, I have a hypothesis about this. If I have prejudices, so also you might have prejudices too. In the way that I'm using the word prejudice, some of those prejudices might be bad and some of them might be good. Some of those prejudices might be conscious, like giving student drivers a wide berth, or some of them might be unconscious or prejudices that we do not easily recognize. I've been challenged in recent days to examine my own opinions and prejudices by people close to me and by our culture as a whole. This is where I have to start listening so that I can learn from others. Let me give you an illustration. A Jewish teenager Anne Frank lived in the Netherlands in the 1940s. However, in her early teen years, the army of Nazi Germany invaded her homeland and with the help of other caring people she hid from the Nazis for several years. Eventually she was discovered and taken captive and tragically with millions of others she died in a Nazi concentration camp in 1945. But while she was in hiding she kept a diary of her thoughts and feelings that has since become world famous. In the diary of Anne Frank she makes several discoveries and statements about life and prejudice. Her primary observation is that we all have prejudices and that we are all affected by them. Everyone has definite ideas and opinions about certain groups of people that never apply to all members of that group. If you're aware of this fact, 
you have already taken an exemplary step in dealing with any prejudices and opinions, both positive and negative, in your life. It's obvious to us that in our great country, negative prejudice should never lead to discrimination towards others. This is part of our painful and historic growth as a nation, as well as an important principle of love that Jesus taught us. In the face of a lot of negative prejudice in his own religion, Jesus taught us well about these things. His life and teaching confronted the superior attitudes of the Pharisees of his day. He confronted their negative racial and cultural prejudices. For example, the hero of the of Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan came from an ethnic group that was hated by the Jews. The perspective of the Pharisees was that there was no such thing as a Good Samaritan. They were all to be excluded from the Jews. However, Jesus taught that we should love one another, regardless of our religious or ethnic origin. Then the last thing that he told us before he ascended into heaven was that he commanded his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations in Matthew 28, and the early Christians began to do so at once. For us, the, the words of Jesus are to be taken seriously and applied to our lives. We see it as our responsibility to love our neighbor and even to do good to those who despitefully use us, as he mentioned in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. We're also encouraged by Jesus' half-brother James to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. I've learned that over the years that there's a lot of difference between listening and hearing. To hear is to perceive with the ear the sound made by someone or something. Basically, you are aware of the noise someone is making. To listen is to give one's attention to, to make notice of and act upon what someone says. Most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. I am guilty of this, the lousy listener. When we focus on responding, we don't listen. We're not present in the moment like we should be. Listening is an act of love where you give your time and your attention, your ears and hopefully your heart to someone else. By the way, most of us are very poor listeners. You notice we don't have courses in how to listen. We learn how to speak, learn how to write, we learn how to do various things, but we don't learn how to listen very well. And so people are not skillful in this area at all. However, people long for the connection of listening. True effective listening requires other-centeredness. We're tempted to not even be fully attentive to what another person is saying because we are thinking about what we are going to say next. By doing so, we often jump to conclusions or we step on other people's ideas. That's kind of like stepping on their toes. But metaphorically, it's as if we step on their ideas. There's quite an art to listening and I, for one, need to learn a lot more about this because listening is loving and listening is caring. There's a story I once heard of an Australian man who has been called an angel. His real name is Don Ritchie and for the last 50 years he's lived across the street from a rock cliff at the entrance to Sydney Harbour. It's called, the place is called The Gap. While this rock cliff is famous for its views, it's also famous for another reason. Since the 1800s, people have come to this place to jump off of the cliff and to end their lives. There is only a small fence separating people from the edge. On the average, approximately one person a week attempts to take their lives there. Yet there is one man there who has been trying to make a difference. He said, you can't just sit there and watch them. Don said in an interview, you got to try and save them. It's pretty simple. So that's what Don has been doing for about 50 years. According to official records, he has saved 160 people. But according to ABC News, that number is much higher, 
probably close to 500. How does he do it? Each morning as he gets out of bed, he looks out of his window, and throughout the day, he keeps watch to see if someone is alone and close to the edge. If he notices this, he rushes out to, out of his house to interact with that person. A news article describes those moments well, quote, in those bleak moments when the lost souls stand atop the cliff, wondering whether to jump, the sound of the wind and the waves are broken by a soft voice. Why don't you come and have a cup of tea? The stranger would ask. And when they turned to him, his smile was often their hope. That's all he did. He offered them a cup of tea, a smile, and most importantly, someone not just to hear them, but to understand their pain. Someone who would really, truly listen. The news article continues, Don remains available to lend an ear, though he never tries to counsel, advise, or pry. He just gives them a warm smile, asks if they'd like to talk, and invites them back to his house for tea. Sometimes they join him. I'm offering them an alternative, really, Don Ritchie says. I always act in a friendly manner. I smile. It's amazing what a simple cup of tea, a smile, and a listening ear can do for another person. While this cannot save everyone, which is true even for the Australian angel, it is true that simple kindness and a listening ear is often what speaks love in dramatic ways of hope. This is an interesting time to be alive. We live in a time when everyone has a message, a revelation, an opinion, a theory, and a point. Turn on the radio or television and you can experience a hundred different voices with a thousand different messages. All of them trying to convince you to receive their words. Why? Because they realize that you're indeed going to listen to someone. And whomever you listen to will have a great influence and control in your life. The last several months, the consumption of information has increased exponentially. All of a sudden, everyone has an opinion, and everyone is an expert. With the noise level so deafening, I've asked myself, does a Christian worldview truly have an impact at a time when so many people are shouting into cyberspace? So in relationship to living in a community, what voices do you listen to, especially when chaos reigns in our culture? During this time, we all realize that something's wrong. Something's broken. Chaos has been the byproduct of these wacky virus days. But what is behind the chaos? Author Peter Kreft has written, Chaos is to a community what disease is to a body. Community integrates. Chaos disintegrates. Community brings coherence. Chaos causes incoherence. Community is construction. Chaos is deconstruction. Now the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 14 that God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So we do seek the peace of God to overcome the chaos of the world. Some of the voices I have heard recently, I believe, are untrue in their criticism of our country. However, my commitment to practicing the discipline of listening has caused me to try to listen because I live in a community. Many voices have been harsh and filled with unfounded criticism, while the voice of reason is heard from time to time. During these days, we have been dealing with two viruses, the obvious COVID-19 coronavirus, but also we've been dealing with an older virus, the virus of racism. Many have suggested that we're still wrestling with a socially wide problem of racism, which is defined by Webster as the idea that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. However, we believe that Jesus' teachings, as well as our beliefs of our church and our denomination, stand directly against racism. Our belief states that we renounce any form of radic a racial or ethnic indifference, exclusion, or oppression as a grave sin against God and our fellow human beings. We lament the legacy of every form of racism throughout the world. 
Let me for a moment sound like your high school civics teacher. I want to look back at some of the things we've accomplished in regard to our historical journey, our community, our nation. We know that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. 157 years ago, the United States proclaimed that slavery, slavery would no longer be tolerated in the United States. The 14th Amendment of the Constitution granted Afri African Americans the rights of citizenship, and two years later, Congress passed the 15th Amendment stating that the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by any state on account of race, color, or creed. However, a full 50 years after the 15th Amendment passed, black Americans still found it difficult to vote, especially in the South. Many brave and impassioned Americans protested, marched, and were even arrested toward the uh, voting equality. In 1963 and 1964, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. brought hundreds of black people to the courthouse in Selma, Alabama to register them to vote. When they were turned away, Dr. King organized and led protests that finally turned the tide of American political opinion. In 1964, the 24th Amendment prohibited the use of polling tax in excluding voting rights. In 1965, the Voting Rights Act directed the Attorney General to enforce the right to vote for all people of color. In 19, uh, the Voting Rights Act prohibited the states from using literacy tests and other methods of excluding African Americans from voting. Prior to this, only an estimated 23% of voting age blacks were registered nationally, but by 1969, the number had tripled. While we were saddened by many things in our past history, we do not want to overlook the positive and painful advances in the history of our country. The area of racial injustice is one of those areas, as well as the area of women's rights and opportunities. <coughs> Pardon me. We don't want to disregard the difficult and horrendous achievements that we have accomplished. While those advances have been redemptive, we have a long way to go in continuing to make changes in the hearts of Americans. Now here is the something that I'm going to say before I said something. The greatest future changes in the lives of Americans are not in the area of politics, but in matters of the heart. Therefore, it is incumbent upon the church to continue to proclaim the problems of the heart are solvable. All racism, is a, all racism is a problem of sin. In the heart of man lies the source of all of our troubles and shortcomings in relationship to racism and all other forms of sin. Let me say three things in closing. Number one, if your heart is not broken over the death of a person of any color, please examine your heart. As a Christian, our prayer should always be, Lord Jesus, help me see the people as you see the people and listen to how you listen and respond how you respond. And we weep with those with who weep and we grieve with those who grieve. <clears throat> Number two, in this momentous time, there's actually something that you can do to help others during these hard days. In fact, it is about responding to the theme of this morning's message learning to listen. If everyone in the U.S. did this, it would transform our culture and we would all be better for it. It's awkward. It might be time consuming, but it has the potential to shift your perspective and make you a better listener. The challenge is to start an ongoing, honest conversation with someone that has skin that is a different color than yours. A friend, perhaps a coworker, maybe someone that you serve with in, at, within our church could be someone as a sounding board. When they suggest that you read something, read it. If they suggest that you listen to something, listen. Reach out and ask them to interpret the world as they're experiencing it. Be a listener first and a talker second. Thirdly, I talked this week to another person from our church and 
ask them to give me their feedback on the sermon that I brought to you this morning. This is what they said. <clears throat> you know what I found? It's really easy to listen to people that sound and look a lot like me. It's really easy to listen to the people that I agree with. It's really easy to listen to my favorite people. But that's often not listening to learn. It's listening for affirmation. The persons that I need to listen to more are the ones that are not where I am at. I need to listen to what they are going through and to learn why they are hurting long before I try to speak. <clears throat> I can learn from the person that I don't immediately have a personal connection with because of our different realities. I need to learn to listen to the black person, man or woman, and their pain and their hopes. I need to truly listen to the gay person to understand the difficulty that they're going through and try to invite them for a cup of tea. I need to truly listen to the person who votes differently than I do and see where they, their passion comes from. They continued, <clears throat> If I want to learn about the world and about the pain around me in my community, I need to listen to the voices that don't just echo mine. This person that wrote to me has a lot of insight into reaching others with the gospel and truly caring about others. One of the, <coughs> pardon me, one of the signs of that person's debt is that they're willing to listen and be honest with me and with others. So there are three challenges for us this week. May the Lord help us as we attempt to embrace the discipline of listening to God, to others, and to our community. Let me leave you with this blessing. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling, to stand amazed in his presence, blameless and with great joy. To our only wise God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be the glory and majesty, dominion and authority, now and forever. Amen. God bless you and have a great Independence Day.